Up next is Mr. Gil Block, RDMA Programming Instructor at Hebrew University of Jerusalem and Ben-Gurion University. Mr. Block is an HPC and AI specialist with broad experience in fast inter interconnect technologies for clusters, data centers, and cloud computing, and is an author, co-author of multiple patents in the area of computer networks and network adapters. Today, Mr. Block will present how to use RDMA to accelerate HPC and AI. Mr. Block, you may begin. Well, thank you, Brian, um, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, give me one second to start a presentation, and can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so just before I start uh, talking about RDMA and trends, and I was asked to talk about RDMA in like 20 minutes. Um, and obviously, you are not going to be RDMA experts after this uh, short talk. Uh, so instead of trying and explaining what RDMA is, how the mechanism works, and how to uh, best utilize RDMA, what I'm going to do in these 20 minutes is give you uh, first the reason why RDMA is important give you some mechanisms and, and uh, a quick comparison between RDMA and uh, the standard TCP sockets. And following this call, we will later provide a deeper dive into RDMA in a separate uh, WebEx call. Uh, so again, don't expect to become RDMA experts after this call. Um, and it is great to uh, talk after the previous uh, great talks, and I'll actually touch a few of the points that both Gilad and uh, Professor Panda have already covered, um, and try to connect that to uh, where this RDMA talk is going. Um, so let's start with a few trends that brings us to where we are today. First, uh, Gilad already talked about Moore's law uh, and the fact that CPUs are lagging behind because of all different kind of technologies barriers, um, and uh, they are not really providing the expected performance and the performance we would like to see in the coming years. Um, so basically, while Moore's Law, we're talking about the number of transistors you can put into a silicon die, what we usually care about is the actual performance of the CPU and not the uh, uh, transistor count. Um, and if you look at the performance, uh, there is a gap between what we would like to see and what CPUs can give. And this brings us to a more complicated systems where people put not just CPUs in their system, but also all kinds of accelerators, starting from graphic processing units, the GPUs, uh, putting FPGAs and some uh, uh, flexible kind of logic into the server, uh, and all the way to ASIC that is mission specific, um, like uh, um, AI processing units, uh, Google's CPUs, and there are other examples for those. AI processing units, and we will start seeing more and more heterogeneous systems where you have all kinds of processing engines um, to, to be able to efficiently solve different problems. The, the next trend that Gilad talked about is the data growth, and I'm not going to get into details, just a, a quick um, fact that I think is amazing. 90% of the data that we have today in the world was produced in the last two years. The growth in the rate of generating data is so fast that the data we have today is actually negligible compared to what we will have two years from today. And we need to prepare and figure out how our systems are going to be able to actually make sense of, out of the data. Um, and, and learn things and be able to actually do smart things with the data that we collect. The last one, uh, or almost the last uh, trend that I want to talk about is cloud computing. And actually, we, you have 
you had the opportunity to to learn about um, how MVAPH is being able to use both the uh, Microsoft Azure and the Amazon AWS. And, and for me, what I see when we talk about um, cloud computers is actually a great opportunity. Those giants are building huge data centers with hundreds of thousands of computers. Uh, they are actually deploying probably millions of computers a year. And instead of looking at those as a collection, collection of a very large number of computers, we have the opportunity to look at it as very large computers which are actually distributed, built out of a very large number of computers, very large number of cores, very large number of sockets. But for, for us, we have the opportunity to look at it as actually a giant computer. That all connects to the artificial in intelligence uh, we see now with the growth of data, with the growth of computing power, we have the opportunity to make sense out of all this data. And the latest trend and the latest opportunity is using artificial intelligence to make sense out of the data. Um, and I'm not going to get into the detail of how uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence is being um, executed. But in, uh, if you look at the trend in neural networks, you will see that the neural networks of today are way more complicated than the neural networks we used a few years ago. Um, there are two examples here in this slide. Basically, one of them is image recognition. Following four years of image recognition using neural networks from AlexNet in 2012 to Inception v4 in 2016, the compute power required to train Inception v4 compared to the compute power required to train AlexNet is 350 times higher. Obviously, we cannot create a computer or if you look at the CPU progress, if you compare the, the, the highest performance CPU in 2012 to what you could find in 2016, it was not 350 times faster. The second example here is uh, speech recognition from deep speech to deep sp uh, speech version three. In just three years, the requirement for compute power to train the deep, deep speech neural network grew 30, 30 times in just three years. Again, if you compare the CPUs in 2014 and 2017, the CPU could not be 30 times faster. So I've talked about a collection of, of trends uh, from CPUs to GPUs, from data to neural networks, but why do we care about all that? And the answer is that if you have more data with better models, you will have to find a way to collect all kinds of processing engines, CPUs, GPUs, ASICs, FPGA, whatever you are going to use. But you need a very fast and smart interconnect to be able to take the collection of processing engines and actually build a single very efficient, very strong supercomputer or very strong computer that is able to process all this data, train those neural networks. This, of course, is also true for standard HPC applications. If you just want to do weather modeling and you want to uh, increase the resolution and have more accurate and longer time uh, prediction, you will need a collection, a very large collection of CPUs, GPUs, accelerators, and you will need to connect them and make a very large supercomputer out of those. So uh, you have seen this slide today, moving from CPU-centric to data-centric and offload mechanism. And I'd like to, uh, uh, well, it's not lunch yet, but let's talk about uh, what we are going to have for lunch today, at least what I'm going to, uh, to have for lunch today. And the, I plan to order pizza for lunch. Um, and usually when I do that, I have to call the pizza place 
order the pizza, they will start preparing the pizza, they will make the dough, put the tomato sauce, cheese, I usually take pepperoni with it. They will put it into the oven, wait like seven minutes. Once the pizza is ready, they will put the pizza in the packaging and send it to me, which usually takes like 10 minutes uh, to get from the pizza place to my place. If you look at the overall flow, it will take about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Uh, but there is another way to think about this pizza, pizza thing. What if you could take a truck and actually bake the pizza on the way to my place? What happens is that you make the flow way more efficient. It will take about half the time because now you don't have to wait for the pizza to be baked before it's being delivered. And I'll get hotter, uh, uh, warmer and better pizza. We look at the opportunity at the computer level to actually do the same. You don't want to um, serialize everything. You don't want to wait for the data before you start processing it. You don't want your processing engines to wait for data and only then start processing it. And if you look at the entire system, you can do a, a way more efficient system if you rethink the system and separate processing parts and look at the entire system in a more holistic way um, and try to lay your problem on the system instead of just moving data into CPUs and processing data. Uh, so when you look at the system uh, and you, when you look at the interconnect for the system, what are you looking for? Uh, obviously, you want fast network. Um, so you need high speed network. Um, we will not go through all the details, but this is just an example comparing uh, a system with 32 GPUs uh, training a VGG16 neural network with different uh, interconnect speeds, 10 gigabit per second, 25 gigabit per second, 100 gigabit per second. And you can see that by just adding speed, you get faster training. Uh, here, higher is better. This is the number of images the, the system can uh, process in a second. And you see that by increasing the network speed, you get higher performance, which is sort of obvious, but that's not enough. And um, we had a, a detailed uh, presentation today from uh, Professor Diki Panda, who talked about peer direct and GPU direct. So I'm not going to get in there again, but just figure out that the system is very complicated. You have within the system uh, multiple interconnects, including PCI, including um, NVLink for NVIDIA, in including the CPU. Um, coherency bus like QPI for Intel, and you have the interconnect for uh, connecting multiple net, multiple servers uh, using RDMA technologies. And by doing efficient communication, you can increase performance uh, dramatically. Um, and from that, we, I want to go to RDMA and spend a few minutes to talk about what RDMA is and what it gives you and why uh, you should consider uh, the way you use RDMA and uh, uh, find the efficient way to use RDMA to really uh, get the benefits of RDMA. So let's start with R what RDMA is. Um, I, I assume you already know that it stands for Remote Direct Memory Access, but what does it really mean? Um, so when we talk about remote, uh, it means that we are actually transferring data between nodes. Um, when we talk about direct, it means that we will bypass the operating system kernel, uh, which is not going to be involved in the transfer. Um, and it's all offloaded to the network card. It means that the CPU is not involved in the actual communication. When we talk about memory, the important part here is that we transfer data between user space application virtual memory. We do not talk about uh, uh, system buffers. 
Uh, so there is no extra copying or buffering of the data. We actually communicate from user space virtual memory to user space virtual memory. And when we talk about access, um, there are multiple types of access that are supported by the RDMA specification and devices. Uh, and that includes send and receive, and I'll talk about that uh, in just a few minutes. There is read and write, and there is uh, full support for atomic operations. And again, uh, if time permits, I will give a few words about atomic operations. So as I said, I'm going to give, to, to explain the uh, RDMA by talking about the differences between RDMA and TCP socket. And I assume that you're all familiar with uh, what a TCP socket is and how TCP sockets works. Um, so let's start with the basics. Uh, uh, if we talk about TCP sockets, TCP implements byte stream meaning you usually have a message and you stream it through the uh, TCP socket and then you need the application, the receiver of the message to actually recover the message out of this byte stream to make sense out of the, out of the different parts of the byte stream. When you talk about the RDMA access model, um, you actually send and receive messages. So you preserve the user's message uh, and don't need to reconstruct the message. Um, the second difference, which is probably the most interesting and most important difference, is that while TCP sockets are synchronous, they block until data is sent and received, RDMA is asynchronous. The design of RDMA separates the start and the finish of the operation and there is no blocking during the transfer. So you start an RDMA operation by adding a work to some work queue, and you finish uh, an RDMA operation by, um, by getting the status and an available completion notification in a complete, again, in a queue, in a completion queue. Um, how to exploit asynchronous communication for that we will have to uh, follow up in the uh, uh, more detailed call um, because this is a very interesting opportunity to actually utilize the cpu while the network is doing the, comp the communication so you can completely overlap uh, computation and communication and not just wait for the data to arrive in a blocking kind of uh, uh, access model if you look at TCP socket, uh, to communicate, you use send and receive. Both sides of the communication are participating in the data transfer. One is sending data, the other is receiving data. Um, and that's the most, uh, the, the basic type of operation. If you look at RDMA, basically there are two ways to communicate. Um, one of them is similar to TCP socket uh, with send and receive, where both sides, the sender and the receiver, participate in the uh, uh, operation. But there is also a one-sided communication, one-sided transfer, where only one of the sides initiate and participate in the operation. You can actually put data in a remote process virtual memory without the remote process um, intervention. It doesn't have to be a part of the operation. You can do that with putting data and getting data from a remote process virtual memory. And you can also do that with an atomic operation like a increment, a counter on a remote memory without the process in the remote server uh, being a, a part of this operation. Um, this gives, again, a very great opportunity for a very efficient implementation of communication. Um, and one last difference, if you look at uh, uh, TCP socket, because it's blocking, the user memory is accessible before and after the operation. Uh, before you uh, uh, start the operation, of course, you can change the, da the data in the buffer uh, and you can look at the data in the buffer. 
And that's also true once the operation is complete. But if you look at uh, RDMA, because you are actually doing asynchronous communication and we don't buffer and don't copy data, after starting the communication, you are not allowed to access the data uh, until it's the communication is actually finished. What you do is actually you hand over the user buffer to the network adapter to be able to communicate, to get data in there or to get data out of this buffer. Um, and the ownership of this buffer moves to the network adapter so that it can actually send and receive fr directly from this buffer without copying the data into some um, um, kernel or system buffers. Um, so these are the main differences. And again, this gives great opportunities for uh, system optimizations by using asynchronous, by using one-sided, uh, by actually letting the CPU do, do what the CPU is good at, and that is crunching data and not uh, oversubscribing the CPUs and letting it handle transfer of data. Um, if you look at, hold on, I, Okay, if you just look at the differences in performance between using TCP IP or using RDMA, what we did again is uh, compare the performance of training a ResNet 50 neural network uh, on multiple GPUs from one GPU to 32 GPUs, and we compare the data Again, using exactly the same network speed, but different protocols, RDMA compared to TCP. And you will see that you can gain very uh, large amount of performance by just using the right protocol, a more efficient protocol. Uh, if you look at the uh, right graph, you will see that, well, the yellow line is the ideal where if you use 32 GPUs, for example, that's the rightmost uh, point, data point, you expect to get 32 times the performance of a single GPU. This is the ideal. Obviously, we cannot really get there because there is some inefficiencies and some overheads of distributing the problem. But then if you look at what the performance you can get with TCP IP, you will see that you get a performance of about 20 times uh, a single GPU. You actually lose the performance of about 12 GPUs just by using the wrong protocol. If you use a more efficient protocol and let the CPU do what the CPU or let the GPU do what the GPU is good at and let the network do all the networking with RDMA, with complete offload, OS bypass, uh, and direct access to uh, CPU and GPU memory, you actually gain back the performance and get a performance of about 31 GPUs out of the 32. Um, so with that, let me uh, sort of summarize the benefits of RDMA and the main features. Um, so again, the main features are first remote memory semantics, put, get, what we call one-sided communication in addition to the send-receive that exists in TCP IP. There is a complete kernel bypass and direct user space access to the networking. You do not have to uh, use kernel calls. Uh, all the communication is offloaded to the network adapter. So the CPU doesn't have to deal with packet checks with uh, the transmissions or with the protocol of actually sending and receiving data. Uh, and it's all secure, and I'll talk about that only on the follow-up call. Uh, in terms of application advantage, and this is what we, care, we mostly care about, we get lowest latency because we don't need the uh, software in the way. We get the highest bandwidth. We get lowest CPU con consumption and direct memory access no data copies, and again, we get asynchronous communication. So we start the communication, and while the data goes through the network, the CPU and GPU are now 
totally free to do anything else but communication. They can actually process data. So this summarizes my talk. It was a short one. And of course, as I said, we couldn't go through the details of RDMA. Um, we will follow up with a more detailed RDMA uh, instructions and how to use RDMA and the pitfalls and the best ways to actually use RDMA to get the highest performance possible. Uh, and with that, I will give the, um, the microphone to Brian. If we have any short, any quick questions, we can cover that now. If not, we will do that in the uh, next uh, in the next call. Uh, 